Master, master. Mm -hmm. I, I have. It's up. Uh, it's very bad news. Ah, uh, Shifu. <laughs> there is just news. There is no good or bad. Master, your vision. Your vision was right. Tai Lung has broken out of prison. He's on his way. That is bad news. If you do not believe that the dragon warrior can stop him. The panda? Master, that panda is not the dragon warrior. He wasn't even meant to be here. It was an accident. There are no accidents. <sighs> yes, I know. You've said that already. Twice. Well, that was no accident either. Thrice. My old friend... The panda will never fulfill his destiny, nor you yours, until you let go of the illusion of control. Illusion? Yes. Look at this tree, Sifu. I cannot make it blossom when it suits me, nor make it bear fruit before its time. But there are things we can control. <coughs> I can control when the fruit will fall. <laughs> and I can control... <coughs> Where to plant the seed? Hiya! That is no illusion, Master. Ah, yes. But no matter what you do, that seed will grow to be a peach tree. You may wish for an apple or an orange, but you will get a peach. But a peach cannot defeat Tai Lung. Maybe it can, if you are willing to guide it, to nurture it. To believe in it. But how? How? I need your help, Master. No. You just need to believe. Promise me, Shifu. Promise me you will believe. I... I will try. Mm, good. My time has come. You must continue your journey without me. What, 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 what are you, what? Master! You can't leave me! You must believe. Master!
Stick around when we talk about the Apostles' Creed and all of this in 90 seconds. The Apostles' Creed has a bit of a legacy behind it. A lot of people have heard probably the story that the Apostles' Creed, hence the name, was written by each of the Twelve Apostles, that each contributed a line of the text, and so on and so forth. This is completely a myth. (laughs) There's nothing to this. Rather, the Apostles' Creed comes out of a lot of different creedal affirmations of the second century. We don't actually have a smoking gun here. We don't know where it comes from specifically. We do know of a number of these types of baptismal creeds, though, from the time of the second century. Again, up during the times of persecution, after the times of the apostles, before the conversion of Constantine and others. And what would generally happen is, whenever one converted, it was a common practice for someone to spend up to a year as what we call a catechumen, or someone who was learning the faith that they now profess, learning some of the basics of biblical orthodoxy or faith, all these types of things. And then after a year, you would come to baptism, and it would be asked of you, Christian, what do you believe? And one would rattle off the things that they had learned, often in a formulaic style like a creed. And we know, for example, of one of these types of creeds called the Old Roman Creed, which in many ways is something like the backbone to what we today call the Apostles' Creed. But at some point, much later, mind you, 3rd century, 4th century around there, we begin to see people referring to the Apostles' Creed more or less as a unit, more or less as a known entity of the Christian faith. And it's around this time also that some of the myths about it being written by the apostles themselves are sometimes written down or attributed in the stories. So in other words, the Apostles' Creed is one of these baptismal creeds, one of these basic confessions of faith that many Christians and many churches in the second century would affirm. By the third or fourth century, though, by some time later, it becomes, uh, you might say, an idealized example of many of these types of things. The importance of it, though, is that Christians were always a confessing bunch. They were always a creedal bunch, so that when one came to faith, a creed was often the way that one was led through the basics of what all Christians confess. Um, the Greek word that we sometimes translate as to have faith or believe, it's, it's the same word and it typically means more something like to trust, right? So, I mean, this, the same word, for example, that talks about, you know, believing in Jesus, that same word believe, when it's spoken of of God, is not God doesn't believe in Jesus, but God is faithful. So it's not just so much having a belief system in your head, 
it's, it's believing that Jesus or God is faithful. And, that, and that's what it means to have faith. It means to trust in the faithfulness of God. So yeah, it, it doesn't just mean have these ideas in your head, and if you get the ideas straight, you'll be fine. Um, you know, when someone says to Jesus, you know, I believe, help my unbelief. It isn't like I'm having this intellectual thing going on in my head. It's like, I, I, help me to trust you. I trust you, but I'm having a hard time trusting you. It's not an intellectual process. It's, it's an all-in sort of it's process. It's an intellectual process. It's a trans-intellectual process. It's never reduced to the intellect merely. N n nothing in life is reduced to the intellect merely. But it's, it's emotive, it's visceral, it's our existence. It's the trust fall where you have to put your hands like this and actually fall backwards and feel that fear until somebody actually catches you on the other side. It's not believing they will catch me, but I'm not going to fall back. I just have belief that this person will. And that belief is a good belief because that person's not going to let you fall. They don't want to get sued. They don't want to mop up the blood. Right? They're going to catch you, but it's different when you have to let go of the control, which is why you fold your arms like this. Right? You don't do this. You do this because you have to absolutely trust in that person to catch you. Right? Help my trust. I trust help me trust because it's not easy right now that's normal I think that's a normal expression of faith it may not be what's always there there are many times you feel like I really do trust God right now that's fantastic I'd even say that's the goal but most people aren't there all the time and when you're not there all the time there's nothing wrong with you you're not broken you're not you don't need to be fixed or glued back together again, or yelled at by somebody for not doing it right, that is a part of the path of faith that the Bible itself models for us. Not all the time, but enough times. Now, Walter Brueggemann, uh, the Old Testament theologian, talks about the Bible's core testimony and the counter-testimony. The core testimony is where things are working out. This is how life works. Uh, do this, this will happen. The counter-testimony is a book like Job or Lament Psalms or Ecclesiastes that says, hold on, it's not working. It doesn't work like that. I'm going to challenge the ultimacy of that core narrative and say things don't always work like that. Built into the structure of the Bible itself is that struggle with reality, and solving it is not the point, but by faith, trusting God to live in it, I think that's the point.
after the two days he left for Galilee. Now Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honour in his own country. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, for they also had been there. Once more he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, Yesterday, at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realised that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. What you'll see in the journey of faith today are at least three levels of faith. And that is, uh, first level faith, I trust in your power. That's when someone initially has a need and they believe God might be able to help. Second level faith, I trust in your word. When they actually come to God, they hear what God has to say about their lives. They come to Jesus, they hear his teaching, they hear his word, and they say, hey, that makes a difference. I'm willing to listen. But Jesus wants us to go beyond first level faith and second level faith to third level faith, which is I trust in you. I don't just trust in your power, I don't just trust in your teaching, I trust in you. Because first and second level faith can still be fairly egocentric. I have a need, therefore I come, help me with the need. I hear your teaching, I hear, uh, I hear your word, and I think if I listen to that, my life will be better. I can see it's truth, I should do that, but it can still just be about me. But then there's a falling in love experience, this kind of absolute trust where we say, Jesus, I want you to be everything to me. You're my Lord. You're my God. I follow you. And yes, I become a better person in the process, but it's not just about me. It's really about you. Uh, it is that complete love relationship that Jesus is calling us toward. Let's see the journey of this one person in this passage, but have all of us in mind as we take a look. You've got your Bibles. Once more he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. Remember that? We like that miracle. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. It's a half a day's journey. When the man learned that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. Now, here he comes to Jesus with first level faith. First level faith, I trust in your power. Why has he come to Jesus? He believes Jesus is Lord, he believes Jesus is his God, he wants to give his life to him, he wants to become his disciple, not yet. It's not a bad thing, we all gotta start somewhere. He comes to Jesus because he needs a miracle. And maybe that's why some of you have come to church or you're listening to the podcast, and maybe some of you have hit a dark, difficult time in your life and that just awakens you to the idea of needing God. God often uses pain in our life to draw us closer to him. It's a fine place to start. It's just not a great place to stop. It's inadequate. It's still just falling in love with the power that you can get to serve you rather than with the person who's behind the power who wants to love you. But maybe that's where you are. You response to this man saying, my son's dying, please come. You see the next verse? Verse 48. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. Can we just admit that does not sound very compassionate? <laughs> what? <laughs> My son's dying. Please help me. And Jesus says, oh, you people. You just always want, what's with the miracles? You always want the miracles. Now, this is not a rebuke to this man. This is a lament for a pattern that Jesus has been experiencing. People come to him when they bought him out and they want him to do the miracle for him. Now he doesn't rebuke and say, no way, I'm not. He's saying, I understand why you've come, 
That's not bad, but people keep getting stuck at this level of faith. People just want God to serve them. And you know it needs to be the other way around. So Jesus does make that statement, you people, uh, it, the, the plural of the word you is used in the Greek. It is not just you, he's not saying you, sir. It is you are emblematic of what happens to humanity when they see there's power out there. How can I tap into that power for my own purposes? Now Jesus then responds compassionately as we move forward. Um, the royal official in verse 49 says, again, sir, come down before my child dies. Come, come to my house, you have to travel back with me. Now it's the second time he gives the same request. Jesus, you need to come with me, heal my son. In fact, it's, it's phrased in the form of a command, not a question. I mean, he's, he's willing to do anything he can, throw his weight around, his clout, come, you've gotta come. He's someone of, of authority and he just wants, he'll do anything, get Jesus to come. Now, he has no concept of the possibility of a long distance miracle that Jesus could do it any other way other than actually traveling there, and Jesus throws a wrench into the system. What does Jesus say? Jesus doesn't say, I will come. Jesus says to the men, go. You told me to come, I'm telling you to go. Your son will live. Well, now Jesus has put him in an awkward situation. The man now has to figure out whether or not he should trust Jesus at his word because he's told Jesus, come with me. Jesus says, no, but you go and your son lives. If the man trusts him and he makes the day journey back home and he gets there and no miracle has happened, maybe Jesus just said that to brush him off. But he knows Jesus has the power. He's heard about his miracles. Now he has to go and try and hunt him down again and this time say, no, I told you, this time you have to come. It could end badly. But Jesus says, go, trust me. I don't have to come with you. You go. When you get back, you'll find out your son's okay. And he moves from first level faith to second level faith. He doesn't just trust. The story moves forward where the man took Jesus at his word. Literally, he trusted his word. He believed in his word, second level faith. And he departed. He's on his way home. His servants meet him and tell him, your boy's all right. He says, about what time was my boy, uh, did my boy recover? He says, about one o'clock. They say about one o'clock in the afternoon yesterday. He says, that's exactly the time Jesus said he'd be healed. Puts two and two together. Two together, verse 53, the father realized that this was the exact time in which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. He and his whole household believed. Believed? I thought he was already a believer. He came to Jesus because he believed. And then Jesus told him to go. Your son is gonna be healed. And it says he believed in that. He trusted in his word. He's already a believer in the power of Jesus and then in the word of Jesus. Here at the end of the story, it says he became a believer for the first time. But it already says he believed in Jesus at his word. He believed in his power. Now he becomes a third level believer. Third level faith. Now for the first time at the end, he says, I trust in Jesus. He embraces the fullness of who Jesus is. And this is where we want to move as a church. 